write it upon a staff. Whoever has understanding, let him understand, because here is wisdom. And that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a bit more of a deeper class. This is kind of uh, shadowing the kind of stuff that you're going to get in Phase C, which is not really for that kind of stuff. <laughs> that's, but, what uh, was wow. <laughs> that's what I was. And this told. is kind of this is kind of like a part one. This will pick up uh, later on in Phase C when you look at the whole concept of the three mountains in much greater detail. Mm -hmm. I like the three mountains. Are we going to cover that tonight? So remember that the path that we're on, it's a path of sacrifice, tests, and trials. I mean, when you think about it, even coming here right now tonight is a sacrifice. Because mm -hmm. there's things you'd rather be doing, the ego would rather have you doing all kinds of other things. But to put aside everyday life and actually drag yourself here is a type of sacrifice. And even being able to do this on a weekly basis, being able to find time for the teachings and that kind of thing, that's also a test. Can you incorporate the teachings in everyday life? Can you find the time to self-observe and do practices and that kind of stuff? So to look at this statement, I mean, it seems kind of like, ooh, sacrifice, tests, and trials. It's already been like that to a certain degree, okay? In order to gain true spiritual knowledge and to incarnate the divine within us, we need to be tested to be sure that we're ready for it. Basically, nothing is given for free, right? Just the desire to do something is not merely enough. We have to be able to follow through with that. And going right back to the very first class, we knew that the, the uh, pursuit of Gnosis wasn't an intellectual pursuit. It was one that required a lot of work, a lot of experimentation, a lot of practical work. It's a very practical path. And that's why. It's not something that we can just simply sit around and think about. And one of the reasons why that happens is because there's a, a process of testing. I mean, when we talk about incarnating the divine within us, when we talk about the, the faculties or the powers that can be awoken with the chakras, these aren't things that are just given to anybody, right? We have to earn them. Okay, they're not given for free, they must be earned, and that's the whole part of that. <coughs> simply wanting, simply desiring, we know is a product of the ego. We have to go through and do the actual work in order to get the things that we're looking for. If we work with the three factors, so if we start to work with the three factors, if we work to eliminate the ego, if we transmute our energies, and if we work to help others in their spiritual progress, we begin to be tested. We begin to go through a specific process. And that's really what we're going to look at today when we talk about initiation and the mysteries, the type of process that we'll be put through. Um, and this is all shadows of Master Samuel's book, The Three Mountains. Um, that's the one that actually Justin was reading when he came in, which is kind of neat. Um, so if you ever pick up that book, you'll see a lot of this kind of stuff in there. Okay, so when we really make a dedicated effort to work with the three factors, when they become more than just a theory for us, and we start to put them into practice and really start to advance in them, then we're going to go through tests. There's going to be a, a process of initiation that we're subjected to, and that's what we're going to look at today. These tests are given to us both uh, in the astral and in everyday life by spiritual beings, by higher beings, okay? You don't ask for them, but they're given to us when we're ready. Some things we might be tested in the physical, but a lot of things will be tested in the astral. We'll be put in certain situations or certain events will transpire to just to kind of measure our readiness, just to test our progress. How much have we learned about ourselves? How much of the ego have we eliminated? That kind of thing. And we're going to look at some of those today. We continue to be tested throughout the walk on the path until we reach the end. There's really no kind of uh, point where everything becomes really easy. You can think of the spiritual path being an exponential path. It becomes more difficult the further we go. There's no point where suddenly everything becomes easy and we can kick back and relax and enjoy the ride. That really doesn't happen uh, at any point in our spiritual development. It always requires effort. It's always a difficult thing to do, and we always have to work and work and work. And the more progress we made, or sorry, the more progress we make, sometimes the more difficult the trials and the tests become. Because with the more progress that we make, the more knowledge we're acquiring, the more experience that we're acquiring, the more faculties we're acquiring. <clears throat> We go through a series of tests in the early stages, in the beginning, to make sure that we are ready for the path. Once we've kind of proven our worth, as in that we've put in the necessary preliminary work, because really that's all that we're talking about. We're talking about putting in the homework that's necessary, then we pass the test. Think of a test at school. If you don't do any of the work, 
then the test is going to be really hard. But if you're doing the work and if you're studying, if you're putting in the necessary effort, then the test is really easy. It's the same kind of thing here. We're going to be tested in the higher dimensions and in the physical by spiritual beings that are basically measuring if we're ready, if we're able to receive more knowledge, if we're able to receive more experience, if we're able to progress along the way. Okay, if we pass the tests, then we can really start the path. Because what we're going to see today is the place where we're starting isn't really much of a path. The path itself to merging back with the, with the Absolute, the Ain, has three stages that are referred to as mountains. That's because we have to climb them, and it's a difficult climb. So the symbolism for the journey as we go back to the source of all things is three mountains. You can kind of like just think of it as you know, three hills where each one gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, you can think of it like that. The first two have a peak on which we rest and a descent afterwards before the next one starts. So it's, it's a really hard climb with a lot of work and then a little bit of a reward where it gets easy. Then it's even harder and then it gets easy again, but then it's really hard over here. So the, the process of that journey resembles three mountains. The final one has its summit from where we go into the absolute. So from this point right here, we can just think of merging back to the absolute, okay? which of course is the, the ultimate goal that we're trying to do, going right back to that point of origin. Now, leading up to these three mountains, before you can even start this mountain right here, there's a trail that leads up to them. You can think of this trail as like a little path or a little walkway kind of thing that leads up to the base of that mountain. So we can imagine like we're mountain climbers, but before we can begin to climb that first mountain, we've got to get to the base, okay? And that's what the probative path is. The probative path is the process that has to be undertaken in order to begin the first mountain, okay? Because you can't climb the mountain until you make the journey to get there. Think as if right now you had this dream where you wanted to you know, climb Mount Everest. There's a whole journey from getting you from London, Ontario, all the way into Tibet to make that climb. Okay, it's the same thing here. Before we really begin this journey, there's a path that leads us to that point. That path right here is the probative path. Probative. The whole purpose of this path, and as we travel along it, involves balancing the five centers, purifying the sexual energies, and passing the tests of the nine minor initiations. And that's what we're going to look at in a bit more detail. Okay, we've talked about the five centers before, right? You remember one of the big problems with the five centers is the energies aren't balanced. We're overusing some centers more than the others, and consequently, to be a human being under the influence of the ego, there's a lot of unbalance happening inside of us. Okay? The work with the probative path, working with things like self-observation and elimination of the ego, helps us to balance the five centers, okay, to put us in a different state of consciousness. We've talked about the sexual energies before, and we know that while we're always feeding lust and feeding the other egos with the sexual energies, then they're in a different state. They're at a lower state than they need to be, okay? And we know that part of the path, working with the third factor, so we've talked about, you know, death of the ego, and then when we talk about purifying the sexual energies, we're talking about the birth of the solar bodies, which is part of this process as well. And we'll look at as well the process of the tests of the nine minor initiations. So all this stuff is happening on this path. So by the time we get here, we've learned a lot about ourselves, our energies are balanced, the sexual energies are purified, and we're ready to begin that climb. You could think of this almost like a school on mountain climbing. Right? You want to climb a mountain, somewhere along the way, you're going to have to get all the equipment, someone's going to have to teach you how to do it, right? You're going to have to be prepared for that climb. That's what the probative path is all about, preparing us for the climb that we're going to have to make to tackle that first mountain. As we look at the concept of being tested today, one of the things people always are concerned about is, what, what if I fail? What if I fail? What we have to remember is, we fail tests because there hasn't been enough work on the death of the ego. I mean, people get caught up with things like astral projection. That's a very exciting thing to do, right? To explore for yourself the reality of the astral dimension. People get caught up with things like remembering past lives or intuition or telepathy and stuff like that. And it's really easy to forget the hardest part of the work, the death. 
the death of the ego. And if there's anything that's going to cause us to stumble, that's going to cause us to slip and fall on that climb, it's going to be the ego. Okay, and that's why we have to remember that this is a, you know, a three-pronged attack. We've got the birth, the death, and the sacrifice. We need a mix of all three of those working together to temper each other. You can't just focus on the birth of the solar bodies and forget about self-observation and forget about the death of the ego. You can't just focus on sacrifice for humanity and forget about the birth of the solar bodies or forget about the ego. We need a balance of all three of these things. If we don't have that balance, then somewhere along the way, we're going to slip and fall on that path. <clears throat> we're going to look at this as a big map in detail, and then we're going to go through and examine each of the pieces. Okay, so I'm going to give you an overview of the whole process, and then we'll go through in detail. So part of this probative path, at one point we have to face the guardians of the threshold. And there's three of them, the guardian and the astral, the mental, and the causal dimensions, or the causal planes. Okay, so there's three guardians that we have to meet at different levels in the higher dimensions. After we pass and face the guardians of the threshold, we cross through something that's referred to as the Hall of Fire. Like I said, we're going to talk about each one of these in detail. After the Hall of Fire, we face the trials of the elements, the trial by fire, earth, air, and water. We've probably heard of that before. That's a common expression, right? Trial by fire. Where that actually comes from is the initiatic process that people were subjected to for thousands of years. We're going to look at each of those in details as well. After the trials of the elements, we then have to go through the nine minor initiations. And that together is the probative path. Okay, so as we go along this path here, these are the different levels that we're crossing through. We're facing the three guardians, crossing through the hall of fire, undergoing the four trials of the elements, and then facing the nine minor initiations. After that, we then begin the eight major initiations. And this is the real path. This is the real journey. This is where we're starting here and going through the climb of the mountains. Okay, you can think of where we are right now. This is kind of like kindergarten. You're not even ready for grade school yet. This is just easy half a day, you know, play with sand, play with water kind of stuff. You're not even ready for real school yet. This is where the real school begins. So all this is kindergarten, here is grade one, that's your university degree, if you want to think of it that way. Right? You've got public school, you've got high school, and you've got university, as an example. Okay? So that's where the real path begins, the real initiatic path. What that represents is raising the serpents in each of the bodies. Okay, remember we have to raise the serpent upon the staff seven times. Yes, the Kundalini has seven degrees of power. Okay, the beginning of the ascent up the first mountain, so this point right here, is raising the serpent in the physical body. And there's different serpents encountered at different points along the path. We'll look at some of that today, and then we'll look a little bit more of that in phase C. Okay, so the probative path has all these steps, and this is where we're really tested to make sure if we're even worthy to begin this, if we even have enough preparation to begin that path. So as much as we talk about the path, we're really not quite on it yet until we get here. Yes? I was just looking on, um, at Chinese horoscopes, and their elements are fire, wood, earth, and water. Like, is wood an element? Or, like, what is an element? Why is air an element? Because it's like... <laughs> it's so all around it, you. Why, why don't they have air as theirs? They, they, just they have more than that. They even call steel in that separate element as well. Oh yes, well. they have metal. metal. That's yeah. right. They have yeah. metal. Yeah. There's yeah. just a completely yeah. different structure. But, but I didn't see any air. Metal and wood all are basically coming from the earth. I don't, I don't know why, because I don't know much about Chinese, mm -hmm. the horoscopes and that kind of stuff. But yeah, they use a completely different system altogether. Um, but yeah, when you think about it, like wood is a, basically a product of the earth. I don't know why they don't be there. Okay, so we'll have a look uh, at each of these in a bit of detail to see what happens. So the first trial that we face somewhere along the probated path, the very first kind of obstacle or challenge that's given to us is the guardian of the threshold, the very first guardian of the threshold. And this trial takes place in the astral world. So this is something that we have to face in the astral. If we don't have our dream memory developed, if you haven't been working to record our dreams, if you haven't been working with our dream diary and trying to remember our dreams, you might not remember very much about all of these processes. Okay, that's why we talked so much about the importance 
of dream memory. Because remember, there's so many things we do in the internal world at night when we sleep, and if we don't, if we're not able to recall any of that, it's not going to benefit us directly. And that's why Master Samal spent a lot of time talking about the importance of developing dream memory, being able to recall your dreams. So some of these things, for example, may have already happened to you already, and you may or may not be able to remember them depending on how developed your dream memory is. And that's unfortunate because we could have progress on the path. We could learn important lessons about, you know, things that we've done or, or passes or failures, and we just don't remember any of them, which is really unfortunate. So don't forget, too, that one of the things we're focusing on, including self-observation, including on concentrating, including working in the astral and all that stuff, don't forget that we're trying to develop our dream memory as well and still working with that dream diary. What happens in this trial? The candidate has to invoke the guardian. A terrible electric hurricane precedes the terrible apparition. So this is the storm that we face before we fight the monster. And think of all the stories, all the myths and fables where the hero has to battle some sort of monster and creature. At some point, we're going to go through the same thing. It's interesting because the monster that we fight is ourself. The monster, that terrible apparition that we face, is our own egos. The terrible ugliness of our own sins, our own errors. It is the living mirror of our own evils. Okay, and this is depicted, uh, I'm going to get a little bit of a sci-fi nerd on you. Star Wars, if you've seen the movie Star Wars, remember when Luke Skywalker goes to fight Darth Vader when he's with Yoda and he goes, I'm talking to you guys probably, right? And he goes into the cave and he fights Darth Vader, cuts his head off and sees that it's him inside. That's exactly what we're talking about here. He was fighting himself. He was fighting his own dark side. That's what was represented when we face the first guarding the threshold in the astral level. Okay, so it's, it's our own ego that we're fighting. So to you in a dream, perhaps this is you being, you know, chased or having to fight a monster. A terrible struggle ensues, face-to-face, -face, hand hand-to-hand combat, just like all the stories and fables and tales of the world's religions where the hero has to battle the dragon or the demon or the monster or something, right? We've all read those stories. Uh, a lot of people fail this terrible trial. If the guardian wins, we become enslaved by the monster, which basically means we've, you know, cowered and given up and handed the monster control. That represents the ego winning, becoming enslaved by the ego, right? Remember, if we're going to fail this trial, it's because we haven't worked with the ego enough. We haven't worked on the death enough, so the ego is very, very strong and easily defeats us. If we've been working on the death of the ego, then we're, our consciousness is stronger and the ego is weaker. So when we face the monster, well, we might be stronger than it or a lot more stronger than if we hadn't done any work whatsoever. If we win, the monster flees and the egos lose some of their power over us. But it's not representing complete dominion over the ego. Okay, it's a small milestone. It's one battle that we've won, but the ego is going to come back for round two at some point. So we've gained some control, but we still have a lot of ego left. Okay, so if we cower and run in fear from the monster, that represents basically running in fear from the ego, which means we don't have the strength, the willpower to fight against our defects. Okay, what would happen? Nothing necessarily. It's not like anything bad happens to us. It's not like we die in our sleep or anything weird like that. What might perhaps happen to somebody who faced this trial a couple times and lost? They might just become disinterested in the studies. Okay, and that's basically, it's not like there's anything ne negative going to happen to us. It's not like anything bad's going to happen. It's not like we're going to get sick or something like that. It just means that in the end, the ego would win, and we might just lose interest in these studies and perhaps pursue something else. We'll look for another thing to spend our time, another hobby, another interest, or something like that. So it's not like if we lose, something bad happens. If we win, what's happened is we're received... We're congratulated and taken to a place called the Chamber of the Children, where the Masters await us to congratulate us for winning the, winning the fight, the first fight, passing or beating you know, the, the ego in round one, so to speak. Okay? And the Chamber of Children is interesting. Why, why, would it, why would we have a place called the Chamber of the Children? Uh, remember the quote from Jesus, Except ye become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. What's the uh, analogy here for little children? What does this mean? The essence? The essence? Yeah, the lack of the ego, absolutely. 
Okay, when we think of that, what is it that uh, separates us from children? Little children have that innocence in them because all they have is the essence. The ego hasn't fully developed yet. But, you know, that's why we want to be as little children. We want to eliminate our ego, return back to that innocent state which we were, and then from that point we can enter into the kingdom of heaven. So that's what the chamber of children is all about. It's an analogy for that whole process, the process of taking back control from the ego eliminating some of the egos. Then after we've passed the first trial, the next thing we encounter on the path is the second trial. We face a different guardian. We battle a different monster here. But the guardian of the first guardian of the threshold has a second aspect in the mental plane. Okay, so the first guardian, the first monster we battle is in the astral. The second one we face is in the mental. We have to remember that the mind, the intellect, is still not human. It's an animal. That's why when you read Master Sun Al's books, he often doesn't say man. He says intellectual animal falsely called man. Okay? Because we have this mammal's body, right? We're really animals. The only thing that separates us from an animal is we have free will. But we still have a lot of those instincts. A lot of those subconscious things happening in the background that animals have. We're not, we haven't realized our true potential. We haven't incarnated our higher self. Okay, we're still animal in many aspects. And all it takes is opening a newspaper or watching the news to find lots of examples of humans acting, unfortunately, quite like animals in many circumstances, right? In the mental plane, it's said that each person takes on the likeness of the animal that corresponds with their character. <laughs> So a lot of the egos that we have can be represented by animals. And a lot of the egos that we have actually have their origin at that level as well. So think of somebody who's a student being like a fox. You call somebody who's passionate a dog, right? This is why we do, because you're describing the qualities that they possess that are animal-like. So when you call somebody, you know, a dog, it's because they're acting like <laughs> that animal. They carry those qualities within them. Okay, so in the mental plane, the egos will actually take on those likenesses, and that's how they can appear to us, that's how we can see them. The encounter with the guardian of the mental plane is even more horrible than the astral. It's more of a fight, okay? If we, you know, think of a, you know, a boxing match, the first person we, we beat was easy, the second person is going to be harder, it's going to increase the difficulty with each level that we go. All our mental crimes are personified in this entity. Okay, so we know the astral plane is related with the emotional center and the emotions. The mental plane is related with the intellectual center and the thoughts that we have. So all those negative thoughts that we've always, you know, been thinking and feeding all those egos for our entire life, this is where we face up to those. This is where we come face to face with all the mental crimes, all the negative thoughts that we've had all the negative intellectual energy that we've been feeding for our entire life, we come face to face with it as represented with the second guardian. So this is uh, once again us fighting a monster, but the monster now represents all the intellectual stuff that we've done, all the negative intellectual energy, all the egos in the intellectual center are what we're fighting. The astral represented the emotional level and the egos associated with that. Now we're looking at the mental plane and the egos associated with the intellectual center. It's the same thing, we invoke the guardian who is once again preceded by the storm, the, the, the hurricane, all that kind of stuff. And once again, if we win, we're taken to the chamber of the children in the mental plane. And the same thing as last time. If we lose, we remain enslaved by the monster. We always, you know, fear the monster and hand over control, which means we remain enslaved by the intellectual egos. Okay, the ego's in the intellectual center, which once again, if we lose, it's not like we, something bad happens to us, it's just, you know, we, we probably get disinterested in the studies, we're no longer seeking a spiritual path, we give up the complacency of every day, 9 to 5, in the day in, day out, regular life. Then after the second is the third. Okay, the third guardian takes place in the world of the will, the council plan. Okay, which is the next dimension, right? We know the dimensions. We've got the three dimensions before us. There's the fourth dimension, the etheric or the vital. There's the fifth dimension that has the two aspects, the astral and the mental. And then beyond that is the causal dimension, the world of the will, the causal plane. 
And the demon of ill will, the guardian of ill will, is the most terrible of all three of the guardians. People only do their will, the will of the ego. Right? Remember the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, thy will be done. That's the will that we're supposed to be following, is the will of the higher self, the Father in heaven. But we don't listen to that. One of the interesting things about being human is we are given free will. We have a choice of what we can do. We can basically, it's the whole analogy of the devil on the shoulder and the angel on the shoulder, who we can listen to, our higher self and the will of our Father, or instead are going to be caught up and falsely identify with the ego as ourself and feed it and do its will for the entire lifetime. And for many people, that's what they do. They do their own will. They don't listen to the will of the Father. They simply surrender to the will of the ego and spend their whole life serving the will of the ego. A master, remember, would be constantly in a state of doing the will of the Father. And if you remember the Lord's Prayer, our Father, Lord in heaven, right? That's the whole thing. We are find ourselves stuck in a situation where we only ever do the will of the ego. We don't even know there's anything different. We don't even know what the will of our Father is. We don't even know how to find it. We don't even know how to listen to it. We so caught up with identifying with our ego and who that is and how to keep that satisfied, we forget all about this. If we win, same thing, we're received in the chamber of the children on the council plane. If we lose, then once again we've you know, hand control back over the ego, you know, cower away and, and go back to our regular everyday mundane life. Remembering that if any of the, the guardians, it's basically measuring how much work we've done with the death. How strong is our consciousness? If we haven't been working with the death of the ego, then the ego's really strong, the consciousness is really weak, and we're easily defeated by the guardians. If we're working with self-observation, if we're working towards elimination of the ego, then the consciousness is stronger and the ego is weaker. And when we face the guardians, we have a better chance of, of, of winning, a better chance of progressing beyond that level. And then that brings us to the Hall of Fire. So the first thing we encounter down here on the probative path is at that level you could say there's the three guardians down there in each of the three levels the astral, the mental, and the council. After that, we get to the Hall of Fire. After passing the three basic trials of the Guardians, we enter the Hall of Fire where it's said that flames purify our internal vehicles. Okay, this is a place of purification because remember that the probative path was all about balancing the energies, which of course is, is directly related to the death of the ego, and it's also about purifying the sexual energies. And the Hall of Fire is a place of purification. After that, we face the trials of the elements, the trial by fire, earth, air, and water. Because the trials of the elements are interesting because they're, each trial is basically measuring the strength of a particular ego to see how much death or how much work we've done with a particular ego. In ancient Egypt, the four trials took place in the physical world. So in ancient times, the trial by fire was you were basically thrown into fire to see if you could survive. If you'd done enough work and if you had enough, you know, and it worked with the death of the ego and had enough of a consciousness active and you're able to communicate with the elementals and that kind of stuff, then you'd remain alive in the flames, right? Today we face them in the higher dimensions, so no one's going to be throwing you in any flames or dropping you off on any cliffs or throwing you in any lakes or anything else like that. Okay, today this is something <coughs> you're going to face in the higher dimensions. The first one we'll look at is the one that's the most famous here. The expression trial by fire, people use that all the time, right? The trial by fire is to prove the serenity and the sweetness of the candidate. The wrathful, angry, and bad-tempered inevitably fail this trial. Because that's basically the specific ego the trial of fire is testing. Think of fire and heat and, you know, anger and Mars and war and all that kind of stuff. There is a relationship with there. Or sorry, there's a relationship there. So people who don't have control over anger and wrath and their temper, people that have a short fuse that haven't worked with enough of that ego and haven't encountered any death with that ego, they're the ones that are going to fail this trial. They're the ones that are going to fail the trial by fire. 
During this trial, we find ourselves persecuted, insulted, wronged, etc., etc. So imagine a dream where this is happening to you. You're wrongly persecuted. If you react violently, if you, you know, fight back and that kind of stuff, then you return to the physical body having, having failed completely. Right? If we're concerned with what other people think of us and how other people judge us, if that anger is something that we don't have control over, then we're going to fail this trial. And it's interesting to study Master Samael's life because at one point he found himself actually persecuted and wrong. He was placed in jail and he was accused of being a pornographer because he wrote a book that talked about the sexual energies and the sex act itself. But he did that in Latin America in the 1950s and it was a very heavily Catholic society. You couldn't talk about sex openly like that or to make a book that talked about sexual magic. So he found himself persecuted and he was actually put in jail as well and arrested for these supposed crimes. So he was interesting because that's, we see an aspect of that represented in the physical. But for us it could be something that occurs perhaps in a dream, in the astral. To us it might appear as a dream, but it could really be an aspect of this test. Okay, if we don't control anger, if we haven't self-observed <coughs> anger within us, and if we haven't worked to eliminate that ego, then we're probably going to act or react to the situation with anger and fail. Okay? The flames horrify the weak, if you think of it that way. Those that haven't worked for that strength, the strength of the consciousness. The next one is the trial of air. And this trial tests our attachments. And this is a really interesting one. Okay? The attachments that we have to things. Those who despair because they lose something those who despair because they lose someone, those who fear poverty, those who are not willing to lose that which they most love will fail in the trial of error. When you think about, think of all the things that we're attached to, all the things that we couldn't live without, right? And not yeah. just things. Think, like this. I feel that. think of the attachment that we have to people also, as well. I was going to say that I hurt my kid or something. I couldn't do it. And remember, what's, what is it that we fear most? What is it that humanity feels most, fears most? Death. Yeah. And what is death? Just an attachment, or the fear of death is nothing but an attachment to the physical world and the physical body. Right? And it's interesting psychologically to study death because the fear of death motivates people to do all kinds of really weird, silly okay. things as even as a society as a whole. So those who are afraid to lose, afraid to lose their possessions, their car, their job, their house, afraid to lose their friends, their family, their significant other, and finally afraid to lose their own life, these are people that are attached, firmly attached to the physical. Okay, and in the end, what is it that keeps people attached to the physical? It's the egos that we carry, right? They're the people that fail the trial of error. And with the trial of error, we imagine or dream that we're thrown into the depths of a precipice. Or thrown off a cliff in the ancient days. You were literally thrown off a cliff. Yep. And if you were, if you valued your physical body and the concept of death so much, if you screamed and were terrified at the idea that you might die, then you were taken back to the physical world. Okay. And if you think of, um, there's even in yeah, movies depicted as this: they take somebody up and they think they're at a really high cliff, but they're not at a really high cliff. It's just like a couple feet, and then they push them off, and they're really not going to plummet to the bottom, but they think they are. If they scream and shout, then they feel that process. If they believe that they're dying and don't, you know, basically ex accept that, if they scream out and they, they're terrified or horrified at the idea that they might lose their physical body, that's an example of how you would fail that particular trial because you haven't worked enough with the death of the ego. You're too attached to the physical and to things and to people. Which ego would that be? That's a, that's a whole group of Group the whole group them, of yeah. egos associated with that. Yeah. Remember, in many cases, when you think of um, uh, attachment to things, it's like gluttony. That's an example of that. Oh. Your attachment to a significant other, many times the love we perceive is Obsessions. more lust than anything else. Yeah. So that's, you're obsessed you know, with something or someone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Greed and, and gluttony and all that stuff Greed comes into play. There's yeah. a lot of different ones oh, here. Good, good. That one, that's why it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Trial of water, and the great trial of water is really terrible. The candidate is thrown into the ocean and believes themselves to be drowning. Which is kind of a, a weird yeah. one. 
Those who do not know how to adapt to the various social conditions of life, those who do not know how to live among the poor, those who after being shipwrecked in the ocean of life reject struggle and prefer to die, the weak fail this trial. Okay? This is basically a, a test that measures, you think of it as willpower and perseverance. Okay? People who don't have the willpower and the perseverance. And this one's always a weird one to me, and then I came across an article once, and it was a study of people that had drowned. And most of the time, people drown unnecessarily. People drown because they give up. Like, the human body actually floats. It's buoyant, right? Unless it's a situation where you're talking hypothermia setting in, there's no reason for people to drown. People drown because they panic and give up and don't fight, and they just drown. They well, suck water in their lungs and they're done. They're in the ocean. A shark could come along and... Well, we're not lunch. talking about sharks. Well, there's, it's in the ocean. <laughs> this is an ocean that's free of sharks. It's a, it's oh, a lake. Okay. It's a lake. A lake. Go, lake. That looks like an ocean. That looks like an ocean because it's very big. Oh, okay. Yeah. Are we good? Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Okay. <laughs> that's what this represents. The people that don't have the willpower, the strength, the perseverance to fight. Those that when faced with adversity, adversity just be like, I can't be bothered. And we all know people like that in our lives, right? People or they're that, pessimistic. That aren't fighters. Yeah, overly pessimistic. They're not yeah. Oh, I'll never. Mm -hmm. Those mm -hmm. kind, you will know, yep. never get that. Yeah, those never. are the people that <laughs> fail the trial of water. But but it's like different. The other one was like you're supposed to be able to give up something. To let go. Mm -hmm. to, to let, let go. go. And then this not one, to you're give not up. Supposed to let go. But okay. this is this is this is a struggle, right? Like a oh, okay. think of it like um, you know treading water. Like how long could you do it? Is it an hour? Oh, okay. Like like do you have the strength, the perseverance to continue on the path? You just like ah, forget it. It's not worth it. Okay, how easily do you give up? After that is trial of earth. We have to take or learn to take advantage of the worst adversities in life. The worst adversities bring us the best opportunities. We should learn to smile before all adversity, and this is the law. And this ties in a whole bunch of classes that we had in phase A. Remember that with self-observation, sometimes the most difficult circumstances in life offer us the best opportunity to learn about ourselves. Right? Because that's the time to catch a lot of negative egos. Okay? The egos that cause us a lot of problems, a lot of pain and suffering in life. We also have to remember that when negative things happen to us, sometimes it's like medicine. Right? That's what karma is like. It's medicine that's applied to us for our own good. At the time, it doesn't seem like it's good, but the karma is necessary. It's just like when a child is sick and the, you know, the mom makes them, you know, takes some horrible tasting medicine. The kid doesn't want to taste it. Because it tastes bad and it's horrible, but the mom knows in the long run this is going to be in the best interest for the child. In many cases, karma works like that. That's why we have to learn to smile before all adversity. But we don't do that, right? We do this, oh, woe is me. Why is this happening to me? God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you punishing me? That's how we act in adversity. Instead of saying, why did this happen? What ego do I carry within me that brought about this situation? How can I observe the actions of this ego? How can I eliminate this ego? Okay, and every time something negative happens to us, just like they say that you know, every cloud has a silver lining, it's the same thing. It's an opportunity for self-observation. It's an opportunity to discover another ego, which we can now study and, and learn more about. Okay, so that's what that's all about. Those who succumb to pain before the adversities of life cannot pass this trial. Okay, so those that, that when negative situations happen, do the oh, woe is me, I, what did I do to deserve this? You adopt that negative attitude rather than going, okay, how can I make the best of this situation? How can I use this situation to better myself and better those around me? Those are the people that fail this trial. The symbolism of this trial, uh, in the superior worlds, the candidate finds themselves trapped between two enormous mountains that menacingly close in on him. If the candidate screams in horror, they return to the physical world. So they're given basically this, this seemingly impossible obstacle, and how are they going to adapt to it? If they scream and run away, then, then they die. Um, if, you've ever, if you're familiar with the story of Jason and the Argonauts, okay, where, where he goes on the quest for the Golden Fleece, there's a particular point in his journey where he has to pass through the clashing rocks. He has to sail his boat through um, a narrow strait, and there's these rocks overneath or over top, and every time the boats before him go in, the rocks crash against each other and squash the boat. And for uh, Jason to actually get through, 
he ends up invoking the god Poseidon, the god of the waters, in order to actually get through that trial. So there's a lot of uh, similarities between this particular trial and what's depicted. And if you're familiar with the story of the quest for the Golden Fleece and Jason the Argonauts, the Golden Fleece is, of course, the solar bodies, right? And the whole journey of his story, he fights and slays the seven-headed hydra along the way, represented in fighting the eagle. There's a lot of symbolism in that story. If we're serene, then we're victorious. We basically figure a way out around the problem and go in trying to, you know, solve it as opposed to running away at the, the smallest obstacle, then we're victorious. So we're still in this prophetic path. We did the three guardians, we did the hall of fire, which is right here. We looked at the trials by the four elements. Trials. Still on the probative path. And then that brings us to the nine initiations of the minor mysteries. Okay, when the candidate is successful in all the introductory trials of the path, he has every right to enter the minor mysteries. He or she has every right. So after we face the three guardians and one successfully, pass through the hall of fire and undergone those purifications, and pass the trials by the four elements, then we can receive the initiation of the minor mysteries. Each of the nine initiations of the Minor Mysteries are received in the intimate consciousness. If the student has good memory, they can bring to the physical brain the memory of these initiations. Okay, what are they? I don't know. That's what we have to discover for ourselves, right? Yeah. And that's one of the things that nobody really, not suddenly included, nobody ever spells out what these are. No one says what the mysteries are because it's what they call it a mystery, right? This is knowledge that we receive. This is experience that we get. Um, and it's given to us in our intimate consciousness. It's things that we need for our specific progress, our specific journey. So it's, it might be different for everyone because yeah. everyone could need something different. Yeah, it very different. well could be different for everybody because everybody kind of needs like something a different. Kind of like a personal uh, yeah. thing, you know? Yeah, and that's why I've always, that's why I don't think you can find them listed anywhere. Yeah. Right? And because it's a, it's a, a, a think of what we've had to get through up until this point. These are things that someone just can't tell you. These are things we have to experience for ourselves. There's no list where you can look up what the nine minor mysteries are and how they're given and what that's all about. This is something we have to receive at the level of the intimate consciousness. This is something that's given to us by the <coughs> masters. Things that we need for our particular journey. That's something that we have to do ourselves. No one's ever going to tell us what these are, which is why they call them mysteries. Okay, but once again, if we don't have that dream memory developed, we don't know what's going on. There's a story uh, that Master Samael tells that one night he was expecting an initiation and he went to sleep um, all excited that when he was at the, in the astral that night he was going to be able to, to receive this initiation. And he tossed and turned all night and he woke up the next morning and you know nothing happened and he was basically sitting down to eat breakfast and he talks to his wife, with the Lattice, and you know, she says, oh, what's the matter? And he's like, I, I thought I was going to be receiving this, in, this, this initiation last night. I thought I was going to receive one of these mysteries and, and nothing happened. And I don't understand why. And she looks at him and says, you're crazy. I was there. I saw the whole thing. This is what happened. Why don't you remember it? So there you go. If we don't work on developing the dream memory, if we don't, you know, well, that'd that be a level. bummer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. That's why it's one of the first tools that we give, right? Just like the concept of self-observation, just like the concept of concentration, one of the first tools we talk about are dreams and keeping that dream diary. It's something we actually have to pursue or pursue. Because if we don't have this memory, we don't know we don't know where we are. How do we know where we are? Yeah. You know, how do we know what we're doing? Yes. So is that all you have to do is like record your dreams? Yes. That's, that's where you okay. start. That's how the process that's starts. How starts. Okay. That's how it starts. And the more you train yourself to be conscious of your dreams, the more information you can you actually write like down. Just, like, just when you wake up, think about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like there's a faculty yeah. of our brain that has to be trained to, hey, remember this stuff. Because I'll, I'll get up and I'll know I dreamt something and then I'll just remember certain parts. Yeah. That's what you start by writing down. Yeah, in the, begin in the beginning, you, yeah, you might get a few words in that, but over uh -huh. time, you actually train yourself to pay more attention to your dreams. And don't remember that it's like as soon as you wake up, think about it. You know, try not to move the physical body too much. You sever that connection. You know, don't go to the bathroom, make a cup of coffee, sit on the know, couch, I and go. That. What are you <laughs> Yeah, you want to get it as soon as you remember it. If you need to, keep your dream diary like under your mm -hmm. pillow or right on your nightstand. And as soon as you wake up, 
That's what it is. Okay, and try to, even if you can remember just one fragment, remember um, working with the mantra. Remember this one? And remember too uh, to work with the process of retrospection. So trying to work backwards from the last thing you remember to the beginning. Instead of trying to remember the whole dream at once, just start backwards. So remember, I remember something about I had a briefcase. I had a briefcase. What was the last time I remember a briefcase? Why did I have a briefcase? Standing waiting for a bus. Why was I waiting for a bus? Because I was going to a job interview. Why did I have a job interview? And each new memory kind of has one before it. But if you try to remember the whole dream all in one go, you're probably not going to get it all. So while you're trying to do that, you know, mm -hmm. work with the mantra mm -hmm. Ra Om Ga Om while you're trying to put the dream together backwards. And then what happens is what you do that's mm -hmm. really neat to actually experience because sometimes you'll, I don't remember anything. And you do that for a while and boom, this memory pops up out of no place. Like, where did that come from? And then with that one remi, it releases the next one, it releases the next one, and next thing you know, you have a whole um, chunk of stuff. You know, the weird thing today was like, I knew I dreamt it in because, you know, I was kind of half conscious and I, I could remember it. And then I woke up and I didn't write it down right away. I went to the washroom. Oh, well, I forgot it's it. It's gone. It's mm -hmm. gone. But then yeah. I remembered it later on during the day. Ah, yeah, really that's like what that. it was. And if you're not <laughs> careful, right then they go so quick. <laughs> I've had dreams where I've been like, I don't even have to write this down. This mm -hmm. is so profound and important. And then by the afternoon, I'm like, ah. Uh, what was that it's about weird. again? It's yeah. just gone. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we've all experienced too. Yeah. You could be you could be somewhere late in the afternoon or later in the evening, an event happens, and suddenly a whole dream comes flooding back, yeah. triggered yeah. by that event. Yeah. Yeah. That's that the stuff you've got to write down. Okay, it's literally training yourself to be conscious of what happens at night and what happens when you're in those internal worlds, so you're able to retain all the information. Because if not, there's always going to be this divide between what you're doing in the higher dimensions and what you're doing in the physical, and we can't make that connection. Okay, and that story behind Master Samael shows us that although in the end he was an awakened master and you know went through a whole process, yeah. he was just like us in the beginning. He was just a he was a, a, a fallen master. He had a human body that was full of the same kind of flaws that ours is. He had a consciousness that was you know trapped in ego as well that he had to, to fight to eliminate. He had the same problem with not being able to remember his dreams, and he shows us that it's it's possible to do this in a single lifetime. When the candidate's memory is not good, the poor neophyte is unaware in the physical world of all that he learns and receives in the superior world. So we can't, it's not of any use to us. Yeah. We can't incorporate the lessons, the, 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 the experience that we have in the higher dimensions, we can't incorporate them into our day-to-day -day life. And all these things that happen to us in the higher dimensions can give us so much strength in the physical, give us so many tools that we could use to fight the ego in a day-to-day -day life, but we don't remember any of it. Imagine that, you know, every time you go to off to university or college to learn a, a skill, imagine every time you came home you forgot everything you learned that day. You're not going to be able to make any progress, right, if you didn't remember everything that you did. It's kind of the same thing here. Uh, those who are practicing uh, alchemy, um, they make a lot faster progress through the nine minor initiations. Okay, remembering that even if we're not in a, in a relationship, even if we're not working with alchemy, we can still work with Hamsa. Remember the breathing exercise, Hamsa? And Pranayama is an example. We can work with our energies on our own to a certain extent. It just becomes a little bit more challenging at this point. Okay, if we're working in a couple and we're practicing together, then we make uh, the progress through this particular point is a lot faster. Okay, but it's not that we have to have somebody, if we're not in that situation, if the law hasn't given us that <coughs> yet, then it's going to be a little bit more challenging for us than if we had somebody. But remember, in the end, it's more important to be focused on working and conserving the energies and transmutation than worrying about whether or not we have the right person. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes people get too hung up on that. I need somebody now, 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 I can't do it unless I have somebody. But uh, remembering that the law provides when necessary. So we find ourselves in a situation where we're single or we're in a relationship where, you know, our partner's not quite into these kind of things, then perhaps we're just not ready for that yet. And we should just continue on the, the path, continue yeah, working with your conservation of our energies or, well, <laughs> yeah, something you've got to be careful on, you know, that kind of thing too. Just the law will provide one, one more ready for it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> When the disciple is single, celibate, and absolutely chaste, they also pass the nine 
through the nine initiation story, although there's, they're more slowly, okay? And remembering when we're talking about uh, uh, chaste here, we're talking about, um, remember that when we look at chastity, it's all about conservation of the energies, okay? It's not that, you know, sex is this really bad thing and you can't do it at all. We just know that the chaste in this context means um, conservation of the energies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, those that spill the energies, it's what it's like, you know, trying to take a step here and falling off every time. So just take a step up and then fall down again. That's where you are. <laughs> so. Because if, where they you know, shall remain. Yeah, he just he gets stuck in that loop at the bottom. Because if if we're if we're feeding lust, then we're always enslaved by the ego. There's no point even going through guardians and trials because. You know, the most powerful energies in the human body are the sexual energies. Yeah. If we're serving them up to the ego on a regular basis, then there's no way we're going to be able to, to, to face that ego at any level. Okay, so that's just an interesting note to remember that this path is basically we have to be cons conserving the energies. There's no point in being tested if you can't even get through that level. Yeah. So what's the point, right? You just find yourself stuck, not really going anywhere at the bottom. Um, so it's just a little bit of a reminder that if we're not working on that, then that's where that is. So up to that point, we looked at the three guardians in the astral, the mental, and the council. We looked at the hall of fire. We looked at the trial by the four elements. And then the nine minor initiations were right here. Okay, so after passing the nine minor initiations, we basically begin the major ones right here. So you can think of that one, that first mountain there, the bottom being the first major initiation. You guys can see why I use PowerPoint all the time, because my handwriting is atrocious. Yeah. There you go. Uh, the first serpent that we raise corresponds to raising the Kundalini in the physical body, right? Remember, the Kundalini has seven degrees of power. We raise the serpent on the staff seven times in each of the seven bodies. When the serpent reaches the magnetic field at the root of the nose, the candidate attains the first initiation of major mystery. So raising the kundalini to the level of um, this point in the physical body represents the first major initiation. Okay, so raising the serpent upon the staff in the physical body, that represents the first initiation of major mysteries. And obviously, if we're stuck down here losing energies, we're not going to be raising the serpents to any particular degree. Right? Remembering that raising the kundalini is not an instantaneous process. We have 33 vertebrae, so we go through 33 levels or 33 degrees of power on raising that serpent, which requires a, a fair amount of effort as well. Whoever receives the first initiation of major, of major mysteries receives the flaming sword that gives them the power over the four elements of nature. That's said that. That's what happens when we receive that particular level. And you'll see that the, the sword becomes a symbol in the higher dimensions uh, for the willpower. Okay, Because obviously to get to that level, even though it's just the first serpent, think of everything we've had to go through up until that yeah. point. That's a, mm -hmm. a lot of willpower. That's a lot of determination. That's a lot of, of perseverance that's required for that. We need to practice sexual magic intensely to raise the serpent upon the staff. Love is the basis and foundation of initiation. So it's an interesting thing to think about. Love is the basis and foundation of initiation, but a conscious love, not the love that most people have, which is really just a disguise or another form of lust. At this point, we're talking about a conscious love being the foundation of initiation. The serpent should rise slowly, degree by degree. Um, and the reason why I put that in there, because there's um, people that talk about how there's kundalini spontaneously rose within them. It's, it's, it's not a spontaneous Yeah, it's not a spontaneous process. It's not a rapid process. And there's even places that, uh, you know, you can pay people money to raise your kundalini. I've seen that before, right? They'll do, like, magnetic passes with their hand on an attempt to raise your kundalini. For, nobody can raise your kundalini for you. You have to raise it yourself, and we know how you do that. There are 33 vertebrae in the spine. There are 33 degrees to raising the kundalini. In each vertebra, the tenebris attack us terribly. The kundalini rises very slowly. The tenebris is, of course, the, the, the darkness we carry within the egos. You're depriving them of their food, right? You're basically trying to starve the monsters that live in your backyard. You're going to find that they come knocking on your door pretty soon. 
trying to get that food back. It's the same thing here, which is why that perseverance is so important, which is why self-observation is so important, which is why death of the ego is so important. You want to take as much energy away from the ego as we can, because the stronger the egos, then the more trapped we find the consciousness. Remember, your average person, probably, you know, most of us sitting around right now, we're talking about 97% ego, only 3% consciousness. Okay, we have to work towards tipping the scales drastically there. We have to put an end to all our sins. We have to put an end to all our egos. Not only must we kill desire, but the very shadow of desire as well. Okay, so that's just a statement for us to reflect on. Not only must we kill desire, but the very shadow of desire as well. Okay, which remember we've talked before about the conscious or the psychology being like the layers of an onion. You've got to peel back layer after layer after layer after layer after layer to get to the very root, to get to the very center. And that's something we start to work with while, practi while practicing self-observation. That brings us to the second initiation of major mysteries. The ascent of the serpent in the etheric body is very difficult as well. None of this is really easy because nothing's given for free, right? There's not one of these that's like, oh, this one's really easy. That was automatically. You don't really have to do much. There's nothing like that in this process. Okay. When the second serpent reaches the magnetic field at the root of the nose, the initiate enters the temple to receive the second initiation of major mysteries. So you can look at raising the kundalini into the bodies almost like uh, going up uh, octaves on a piano, moving the frequencies from higher and higher and higher and higher levels. We start by raising the serpent in the physical body, and once it's fully risen in the physical body, then that energy jumps up to a different octave and then starts to raise in the etheric. And after the etheric comes the astral, mental, causal, buddhic, atmic, we've talked about all those before, right? In the second initiation, we receive the body of gold, okay? And you can think of that like almost golden armor if you want to. This initiation is very difficult. The student is tested severely. Okay, because we're starting to make some significant progress along this path now, so the tests are going to become harder and harder. And once again, these are tests that may be in the physical, or more often than not, probably in the astral, in the higher dimensions. We don't have that dream memory developed. You know, we're not going to remember too much of this. So let's have a look at that process again. I'm going to leave it at the second initiation. Um, because when you get to phase C, one of the classes is the three mountains. And you're going to talk about all the different things that happens along this process. Okay, so you can basically think of this as part A. Okay, so we looked at the guardians of the threshold, the astral, the mental, and the council, and each of these were basically facing our own egos. This was the symbolic hand-to-hand -hand combat with the monster, the creature, where the creature, the monster, represented our own darkness. Okay, the emotions, the thoughts, and then the ill will that we carry within. After that, we looked at passing through the Hall of Fire, which was purifying the internal vehicles. After that, we saw the trial of the elements that was just testing things like our anger, our attachments, our, you know, our perseverance, our willpower. These are very specific things that were, were being tested here. Okay, remembering that if we fail any of these, it's not anything bad happens, it's not like something negative is going to happen, um, we just might lose interest. Okay. And it's not like we just get one shot either. We can have a couple of attempts at this before it's probably the ego's too strong and then that's it. Then we just go back to losing interest in the studies and that kind of stuff. And it's interesting because you can see that too sometimes uh, even in the, in the Gnostic movement itself, even in centers. Sometimes you see people that are really, really dedicated and then one day they just kind of stop coming. Um, there's even been this instances here where people have made it to second chamber and you know, they come a week and then you never see them again. And it's always confusing, like, what happens? How would you, why would you be in the studies for two years and never miss a day? And then you kind of get to a point and then you just, you just don't come. Perhaps that's one of the things that's happened to them internally. They've just failed too many tests and the ego's too strong and they just, you know, lost interest, got bored. I'll find a better thing to do on Saturday night or, oh, I've discovered, you know, something else instead or Buddhism or I don't know who knows. People go sometimes jumping from path to path. After the trials of the elements, we then receive the nine major initiation. Or, sorry, the nine minor initiations. These are what we receive in our intimate consciousness. So these are things that are given to us for our own purpose, and you won't find descriptions anywhere of, of what they are. 
and that all represented the probative path, and the real path hasn't even started yet, right? And for many people, we're even, we're just at the, uh, well, we, we're at the uh, grassy trail leading up to the probative path mm -hmm. that leads up to the first mountain, right? Mm -hmm. And then after that, the eight major initiations that represents the traversing of the three mountains. And there's all kinds of things that happen along that path. Like I said, if you're curious, there's a book called The Three Mountains that specifically addresses that. And then there's a lecture we'll have in Phase C that's all about the three mountains, talking about what happens in the different initiations and levels and all things that happen on that. But remember, the, the major initiations begin with the rising of the Kundalini. And we're never going to be able to rise the Kundalini while the eagle has all that, that strength. So that's why you know, the death of the eagle is so important, and that's why the most important technique you guys have been given has been self-observation. That's why we learned about that in class number two, right? It's the first time we looked at it. Yep. Uh, you know, in the Guardians of the Threshold, you said uh, that uh, before the, uh, the battle, there's always an electrical kind of yeah, storm like yeah. yeah. hurricane storm kind of thing. Is there? Yeah. Like, what would that be? Like, a really violent storm? Or? Yeah, that's what it's described as. Oh. Mm -hmm. Any more questions about that? Yes. So, um, what's described in the Three Guardians and the Trial by uh, Elements, is that more sim symbolic, like the closing in of mountains, or is that something that's actually experienced? There can be something you actually experience in the dream. Okay. Yeah. Or something else that's symbolic. There's no textbook that says it happens like this and this is exactly Okay, yeah, that's why I thought I was curious. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in the old days, they used to actually do these things. Drop by fire or fire in water. Wow. But this is all higher dimensions. <laughs> that sounds fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a...